So hey, why don't you go ahead and, uh, and find your seat, and I'm going to dive into the message before I do, a, before I do, I want to talk briefly about this missions trip that we are going to do in just a couple of months. We're, gonna, we're calling it the Carrizo Missions Adventure. Thank you, beautiful young lady. Appreciate that. The Carrizo Mission Adventure, and we got a, a sheet that has information on it. It's in that rack on the back of the wall there, the wooden rack. And if you're interested in really giving a, of a weekend of your life, it's the last weekend of May, which is called uh, Memorial Weekend, right? Is that what that is? Memorial Weekend. If you'd like to give Memorial Weekend to go and serve a church up on the White River Indian Reservation, help them out. There's some projects they need help with. We're going to help redo their roof. There's some painting stuff we're going to do. Maybe you're good with that kind of stuff. It'd just be a great way to invest a weekend of your life and go serve a church that needs some help. And so that's coming up in just a couple of months. You can get all the information you need in that packet or talk to Pastor Miguel, who's down here in the second row. He'd love to help you out. He's going to spearhead this missions adventure. And on top of that, we're actually going to do the Sunday morning service with the church as well. So we're going to help head that up and be a part of that. So it's kind of a cool opportunity for you to have a little short-term weekend warrior missions experience is kind of what it is. All right, well, hey, we are coming back to this series that we started several weeks ago called Go Forth. And it's this, our journey through the book of Acts. And where we left off was when, in Acts chapter 2. We didn't make it very far. And we're not even going to finish chapter 2. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to backtrack a little bit to kind of help set us up where we're going and get, dive into chapter 2 here today. But I'm excited to talk about this. Where we left off in Acts chapter 2 was there was the 120 people that were praying, having this big 10-day long prayer meeting, and the... The baptism of the Holy Spirit took place. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak out another language, speak in tongues. And so we talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the importance of that. And really the importance of that is that, I would say the purpose of that is that you and I would be empowered to be a witness for Jesus. That's the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so Jesus said, Acts 1.8, he says, you will receive power. Everybody say power. power. Okay, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. And so that's why we want to receive this gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is to be a witness for Jesus. So the gift of tongues is not the purpose of it. It is the evidence of it. But the purpose of it is so that you and I would be a witness for, for Jesus. So we believe in that. We're going to read through that. But we're going to focus in on what takes place even after that here today in the rest of, of chapter 2. But I'd like to look at these 120 people that are in the upper room having this prayer meeting. And so I'll read just a few verses in Acts chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 12 through 14. This is what it says. It says, then they returned to Jerusalem. These, the disciples had just got done hanging out with Jesus, by the way. Jesus just ascended into heaven. So they're on their trip back to Jerusalem from the hill called Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Okay, so I wanted to look at all these people that are here in this room and the types of people that are in this room because I think it gives us a beautiful picture of how Jesus wants his church to be. So we don't know all 120 people that are in there, but we know some people. We know there's, there's a tax collector in there. That's Matthew. We know there's a political radical, Simon the Zealot. We know there's a few blue-collar fishermen in there, Peter being one of them who's going to be the head honcho in just a little bit. There's a Greek there, Philip. We got this pessimist. His name is Thomas. We've got Mary, the mother of Jesus. She is there when the church is birthed, along with Jesus' brothers. Okay, so we know all, all those people specifically. There's other women there. It doesn't mention them by name. It's also likely, scholars would say, that there's a Pharisee uh, in the midst of this who is now a believer in Jesus as the Messiah, perhaps even Nicodemus being one of those. Potentially Simon of Cyrene is still around. He's the guy that actually carried the cross of Jesus. Uh, that some scholars believe he perhaps would still be around and would have been in this gathering as well. But here's what we know. In this room, there was poor and wealthy. There was Jews and Greeks. 
There was men and there was women. There was those that were firm in their faith and those that were struggling in their faith still. Brothers, sisters, parents. So you've got this mix of people from all different walks of life. And only one thing could have brought all these diverse people together. They must have all had a love and a belief in Jesus. That's the only thing that could have brought all these people together. But I think this is an amazing picture that, that God gives us as the church is birthed. It's a picture, I think, of how Jesus wants his church to be. It's both the genius and the beauty of the Christian church in that it's full of diversity. Because here's, here's our posture in the church, and here's Jesus' posture in the church. All are invited. Everyone is invited to be a part of my church and my kingdom. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter who your mama is. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, whether you're rich or poor or your political affiliation. It doesn't even matter. All are welcome into the church. In fact, all are invited as well, okay? And so this is a beautiful and powerful picture of the church that's birthed. It's diverse. And I pray that we would continue to be and even grow in diversity. There's health in diversity. Obviously, when, when there's diversity, there's going to be struggles, right? It's going to be struggles, but uh, that's it's the same thing in marriage, right? You've got diversity in marriage. You've got a man and a woman coming together. And when there's a man and a woman trying to live in harmony, that's, that's a tough deal, right? Because that just naturally does not happen. That diversity there causes division oftentimes, and, and so they got to work together on building that unity. But when a marriage is healthy and strong, there's beauty and there's power to that. And so that's, that's the goal for us as a church. We're not a white church. We're not a black church. We're not a brown church. We're not a young church. We're not an old church. Okay, we are one church that welcomes all people, no matter who you are. That's who we want to be. And the, the cool thing is, is that we're seeing that take place within this church. And again, I pray for more because there's beauty to that. And there's power to that. So the first church was birthed out of prayers, out of a prayer meeting. But also it was birthed with diversity. They were in unity, and I would say this. I would argue that the reason there was unity, even in the midst of diversity, is because of all the praying that they were doing. Because prayer builds unity. You want greater unity within your family? Pray. Pray together. You want unity in your marriage? You want a stronger marriage? Pray. Pray together with each other. Okay, Prayer, prayer builds unity. So the whole reason that they're gathered in this room is because Jesus told them. Right? They had just been hanging out with Jesus. Hey, go and wait for this gift. And before you start the church, before you do anything, I need to make sure you have this gift so that you're empowered to actually be the church that I want you to be. And you're empowered to, to be my witnesses. So Jesus didn't want them to start the church until they'd received the gift of the Holy Spirit and received this baptism of the Holy Spirit. So let's read through that again, and then we're going to keep going here in this beginning section of Acts chapter 2. Verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. All right, so let's pause right there. Apparently, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit caused such a commotion that it gathered a massive crowd. Everybody took notice of this. And so as they start gathering around a huge crowd, they begin to hear they're speaking different languages. This is, this is crazy. And so they, they were perplexed. They were bewildered. They were wondering, what's going on? What does this mean? They're asking questions. But some actually start scoffing them, making fun of them, and saying, these guys are obviously drunk. Which is an interesting accusation because I've heard drunk people 
talk before. You've probably heard drunk people talk before, right? And I've never thought once to myself, oh, they're speaking another language. <laughs> oh, they're speaking German. I can tell that is definitely German. Well, of course, maybe lots of Germans with l- their love of beer, they talk like that a lot. I don't know. But uh, I've never thought once to myself that when someone is drunk, it is another language. You just... And so obviously these people are looking for an excuse to put these people down. They maybe want no part to do with their story about Jesus just in case there's any truth to it. And so they're looking to put it down. And they're making up this excuse for, oh, obviously these guys are just weird and crazy. Way too much, made too much wine. So I think it's safe to say this. Day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, changed everything. This is a monumental day in the history of mankind because everything changes from this moment on for 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 human every every human on planet earth but especially those who believe on jesus because think about this in the old testament in prior to this moment even in the in the gospels only a certain few individuals had the holy spirit inside of them But now, from this moment on, everyone who calls on the name of Jesus and believes in him, now the Holy Spirit, God himself, is going to come live inside of them. Before this moment, the presence of God dwelt in this big temple. Now, the New Testament tells us that you and I, we are the temple of God. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so God is going to come and live inside of us, not just in a building, but inside of us. And so that moment begins right here in Acts chapter 2. This day is, is a game changer. So it's a very significant day, and there's a couple things that I see God doing that we learn from God uh, from Acts chapter 2. Number one, we see God's timing at work on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Think about this timing and, and when he's doing this. Now, first think about when Jesus died on the cross. It's no coincidence that he died on Passover. What is Passover? Passover was when, way back in the day, generations before, when the Jews were enslaved in Egypt... And Moses instructed them to, you know, sacrifice a lamb and wipe the blood over the doorposts of of your home. And an angel of death is going to pass over. And whenever he sees the the blood of the Passover lamb, you are protected and he will pass over your home and no one will will be harmed. Well, once you know, the next morning, the Israelites were set free from slavery. And so Passover was a celebration of we are no longer slaves. We are free people. And so you fast forward now to Jesus. Jesus dies on Passover, meaning he becomes our ultimate, perfect Passover lamb. And because he shed his blood, you and I can be free from the slavery of sin. And so the imagery there is is powerful. Now, that was Passover, but then you fast forward 50 days later. Now we're on the day of Pentecost, which was the day that the Jews celebrated the giving of the law. When Moses received the Ten Commandments. So on this day of celebrating the law, the church is birthed in the power of New Testament grace, which is super cool because God just loves to tie the past and the present together and, and weave in his message of grace with all of it. That's what he does. It's his message of grace with the past and the future, no matter what we've done, no matter where, where we've been. He loves to do this. But perhaps even more significant, while this day of Pentecost is going on, this is also the Feast of Weeks celebration. So that was another thing they also celebrated on this day. It was a Feast of Weeks, which was a festival that they would thank God for the harvest. And so they do this every single year as well. And so you've got, on this day of Pentecost, they're celebrating the giving of the law, but they're really celebrating the, the, the harvest. And it's amazing what's taking place right now is this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and it is the beginning, it is uh, imagery, it's also the foreshadowing of God saying, I'm about to do a different type of a harvest. There's going to be a harvest of souls that's going to happen on this day, but also it's going to happen every day from this moment on here, where there's going to be a harvest of souls, not just thanking God for a harvest of food, which we're we're obviously thankful for, but a harvest of souls of people coming into the kingdom of God who are going to believe in Jesus. So the imagery... And the timing of what God is orchestrating through all of this is, it's amazing, friends. And it shows us that you and I can trust God's timing. Let's be real. We often don't. Come on, God, you've been taking way too long. Come on, God, um, man, I've been praying this for like weeks. I'm like, when are you going to show up? We get a little impatient. Uh, you know, God, now would be really good timing. Why are you holding 
back? Why are you holding out on me, God? And we can begin to question God and question his timing. And this story is just another reminder we can trust the timing of God. We think it should happen on day 25. We for sure think it should happen by day 46, but God says, no, I know when day 50 is. You can trust me in my timing. He knows exactly what we need, when we need it, and even how we need it in his love and his wisdom. And so we, we, can, we see God's timing at work, and it reminds us we can trust his timing, but we also see God's power at work here in Acts chapter 2. His power is obvious. In fact, I would say this. God's timing always precedes his power. But we see God's power. This is the power that Jesus had talked about. Acts 1.8. Look at that again, okay? Jesus, in his word, said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. So the power of God obviously falls on all of them. There's the sound of a mighty rushing wind, which is kind of interesting. They don't feel the wind. There's just a sound of the wind. Then there's tongues of fire that separate and come to kind of rest on all of them. Then they begin to speak out in other tongues and other languages, which I believe is a correlation back to Genesis 11, where God scattered, there was one language, and God scattered people uh, throughout the earth and confused their language. Now God is bringing unity again to people under him. And so there's a correlation between Acts 2 and Genesis 11. So the power of God is obviously at work in Acts chapter 2. But then we also see the power at, of God at work by how Peter responds. Because what does Peter do? Peter stands up and begins to address the crowd. In fact, let's, let's read what he says. Turn with verse 14. It says, then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this was what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Okay, so we'll, we'll stop right there. Here's what I want us to notice. The incredible boldness that Peter exercises in that moment right there. Okay, they're getting accused of, you know, being drunkards. People are going, wondering what's going on. Huge crowd, thousands of people. And Peter instantly stands up and begins to declare, hey, let me share with you what is happening. In boldness, he does this. Now, what's interesting about that is just 50 days before that, if you rewind 50 days, Peter is warming his, himself and his hands over a fire in front of a small group of people who are saying, hey, your accent is Galilean. You're one of the, you're one of the Jesus followers. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Then a little girl asks him, hey, I saw you with Jesus. He's like, I have no idea who that man is. And he publicly denies his relationship with Jesus to a small group of people, even to a little girl. That same Peter, now 50 days later, is standing up and addressing thousands. So what's the difference? He's been baptized with the Holy Spirit. He has received power now to be a witness. That's the difference. There's this boldness that happens when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'll never forget. It happened for me years ago when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, I mean, I loved Jesus before, believed in him. But from that moment on, I'm telling you, my life was changed. And I had a greater boldness for my faith in Jesus. I didn't mind talking about him, sharing with him on the sports teams, and just being bold. I'd even had a bunch of Jesus shirts that I got at the time. Because back in the 90s, that was cool, okay? I wore my Jesus shirts. I went surfing with Jesus. I don't remember what it was, but things like that. You know, I just, I had this boldness after that experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And God wants you and I to have a boldness. He wants to empower you to be a witness. Now, every one of you was given one of these cards in the program today. We got this Focus 5 card. If you want to pull that out of your program, love for you to look at that. Because this is something we're looking at weekly right now as we approach Easter. And we're, if you haven't filled this out, I'd encourage you to do so today. Write down five names, and I'm believing these people will come to BRC this Easter and put their trust in Jesus. So this is just a, a tool to remind us to, to be a witness, something very practical. But it's amazing how God can use a practical thing like this. When I write some names down, I'm, I begin to pray. I begin to pray for them. I begin to pray, God, give me conversations to open the door. And at the very least, just invite them to come to church. And I'm just believing that you're going to get a hold of their life on Easter. I'd encourage you guys to use this. Okay, again, simple tool. But let's pray and believe for a bunch of people to come and find Jesus this Easter. That he's going to change their life. I'd love for you to, to, to take this serious and to make this like a, a serious prayer list for some people that you really care about. And so with that, 
Here's what we're praying. God, help us, give us boldness, empower us to, to see this take place, to see actually uh, them come. And so I've got to have the boldness to kind of strike up a conversation like, <clears throat> what, 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 uh, what are you doing for uh, April Fool's Day? <laughs> Did you know April Fool's Day is Easter? Want to come to church? Yeah. Something like that. Hey, April, we could use this April Fool's thing to our advantage, I guess, in conversations, right? Hey, whatever, you know, for some of us, just to invite someone to church, that's, that's a big deal. I'm praying that God would give you boldness, he'd empower you to talk about your faith in Jesus. And God's going to use you. God's gonna, we're just praying for people's lives to be changed uh, because of that. So, Peter, he's like bold Peter now. He's not scaredy cat, I, I'll, I'll deny Jesus to a little girl, Peter. He is like bold Peter standing up addressing thousands of people. I love that it says he stands up, and he stands up with, with the 11, okay? Not with, not with 11, it's a different story, with the 11. And these guys all stand up with him, and they're like, uh, we got your back, Peter. We're, we're, we're in this with you. And he begins to preach the very first Christian sermon ever spoken. This is the sermon that's going to birth the first church, right here. So I'm going to read this sermon to you. I want you to pay attention to what Peter says, maybe even why he's saying it. And I want you to think of yourself as, think of yourself as one of these, these people listening to this. All these people listening to what Peter is saying understand his words. They know the prophets that he's quoting. They know the Old Testament prophets. They know the prophecies about the Messiah. They, they've, they've read this before. They've quoted it. They've got it memorized. And so Peter's referencing back to, to, to those things. They, they know even about Jesus because everything that happened with Jesus, everybody knew about. The entire city, the entire region knew about Jesus. So just imagine yourself being one of these people and you get what, you know, what he's talking about, but then he's tying everything together in this amazing first Christ, Christian sermon. And so just listen to these words. Let's go through this. Start with verse 17. Peter begins by quoting the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And he goes on to explain this. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said this about him. Now he quotes a psalm. I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to, to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ. Christ is the New Testament word for Messiah that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, 
both Lord and Christ. Again, meaning Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Must have been a pretty good sermon, huh? Man, that doesn't happen to me very much. I, I wish that it did. That would be awesome. Like, I get to the end and you're like, what do I do, Tyrone? Come on, I'm just ready. I just need to respond to this. So tell me. How do I respond to this? That would be awesome. <laughs> Maybe you say it internally. I don't know. I'll never forget when we were doing ministry in, in Scotland. And we had just got done with a service. And just got done preaching, talking about Jesus. Worship team came up, started playing this song. I'll never forget the song, The Greatest Love the World Has Ever Known, Overcame the Cross and Grave to Find My Soul. That's how the word started. And uh, I'm telling you, the presence of God fell in this place as we are declaring the gospel of Jesus to a group of teenagers who have never heard about Jesus. They are hearing this for the first time. It's said that that generation was two generations removed from a proclamation or declaration of Jesus. They didn't know about Jesus. And so... Man, the presence of God began to fall in that place. And it was like, whoa, okay, God is, is, is here. Vanessa was there. She can testify to this, this moment. It was, a, it was a powerful moment. I walked up to these teenage boys, and there's tears coming down one of their eyes, their, their faces. And he's like, what's going on? It was kind of similar to this moment. He's like, what is this? I've never felt this before. And I'm like, buddy, that's God all over you. God is showing you he's real, and he loves you, and he cares about you. He's like, I've never felt this before. Man, this is like, I don't know what to do with this. And so it was amazing to have this conversation about Jesus and his love right there in that moment. I love it when I see God do that, where God just begins to move and he begins to speak. And so at the end of this message, man, people are moved. Like, what do we do? Well, did you notice what Peter centered in on throughout his entire sermon? What was his sermon all about? It was all about one person, one man, one God, Jesus. First, he references a passage from the book of Joel, prophet Joel. He says, hey, you see what Joel prophesied? Yeah, that's what's happening today, and Jesus also fulfilled some of that too. Then he, then he shares a couple from Psalm that were prophecies from David about Jesus and so what he's doing is he's pointing back to the, to the prophecies, to the prophets. He's pointing back to the Old Testament and he's saying, hey, guys, we know this stuff. We've heard this stuff. The Old Testament and the prophets, they've all been pointing to this moment because really the Old Testament is really pointing ahead constantly to the Messiah's coming. And so why do we believe in the Old Testament today? Why do we think it's valid today? Because Jesus himself quoted from the Old Testament and the early church, starting right here with the very first church sermon by Peter quotes the Old Testament. So we view the whole Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, as the word of God, as the message of God. And so as you dive into the Old Testament, you see it just points forward. Hey, he's coming. He's coming. The Messiah is coming. Jesus is coming. And then all of a sudden you come to the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, beginning of the New Testament. And what do they declare? They declare he's here. Jesus is here. The Messiah is here. Then you go into the rest of the New Testament, and the rest of the New Testament points back to Jesus. Hey, this is what he did, this is why he did it, and this is how he's calling us to live. We can live this way in light of the cross, what the Messiah did for us. And so all the Bible really points to Jesus. In fact, you jump to Revelation at the very end. What's Revelation tell us? It tells us he's coming back. He's going to rule and reign forever. In fact, you'll see that message sprinkled all throughout the Scripture as well, not just in Revelation. So the whole Bible, friends, is all about Jesus. It points us all to Jesus from Genesis to Revelation, it points us to Jesus. He is the beginning, he is the middle, and he is the end. Okay? Jesus, he's the center for our lives, he's the savior of our life, he is the meaning uh, of our life. He's the reason that we live, friends. He's the reason the church exists. He's definitely the reason this, this church exists. Okay? And the message of our life needs to always center around and be focused on Jesus. The message of this church will always be all about Jesus. Remember, Jesus said this, I want to fill you with power. I want to fill you with my presence. I want to baptize you so that you can be a witness, not for yourself, not for how great you are, 
Not for how cool your, your group is, your ministry is, your church is. We are all witnesses for one person, for one man, for one God, and that is Jesus. So everything centers around Jesus. And I pray that your life would declare one message more than any other message, and that is Jesus. J Peter's sermon is all about Jesus. You can start anywhere in Scripture. Start anywhere. The destination is going to be Jesus. He is the destination. He is what it's all about. He is what our life is all about. And Peter really demonstrates that with that first sermon. The first Christian sermon. It's all about Jesus, friends. So as he gets to the end of his sermon about Jesus, and, and verse 37 describes them as being cut to the heart. They're cut to the heart. That's why they say, what must we do? Because they are cut to the heart. And it's really what's happening is there's some conviction going on. They're convicted. The Holy Spirit is really revealing himself to them. There's some conviction going on, and they're like realizing it, and they're like, ah, how do we deal with this? I mean, these people have never sensed the presence or the Holy Spirit ever in their life. What do we do? We don't know how to respond to this. And it's important for us to know that conviction is good. Yeah. Conviction is not bad. We like to run from conviction. Conviction makes me feel bad. You know, it's like, you know, does God just want to remind me all the bad stuff I'm doing? No, conviction is good because it leads to his freedom. And so you and I got to respond well to conviction because basically God is saying, hey, you got some things weighing you down. You got some things holding you back. You need to let it go. You need to confess, let go of the sin. He convicts us of sin so that we can experience freedom, which, by the way, conviction is way different from condemnation. Sometimes we get the two con con confused, right? So condemnation is from the enemy. Conviction is from God. Conviction brings us closer to God. It draws us to God, but condemnation pushes us away from God. Big, big difference. And so we can't be scared of conviction. It is a good thing, friends. And it is what God is using in this moment to birth the church. They're cut to the heart. They're feeling conviction. And so they say, what do we do? And so this is what Peter tells them to do. Let's go to verse 38. Peter tells them this, essentially just one thing. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who far, are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So Peter's one main direction really is repent. Called the repent. What does it mean to repent? Literally that word means to change the mind. That's what repent means. It's to change the way you think about life and also to change your behavior as well. That's, a, that's true repentance. True repentance is you and I... Uh, humbling ourselves before God, confessing of our sin, asking for forgiveness, and receiving that forgiveness, and it results in a change of our thinking and the change of the way that we live our life. That's true repentance. You could really define and describe repentance as I'm going in this direction, and I'm going to do an about face. That's what repentance is. An about face, I need to go in this direction because this is where God is. I was running away from God. I need to repent and go towards God. And something that you and I continually need to do, by the way, to repent, humbling ourselves before God, confessing and asking for forgiveness. And so Peter says, you need to repent, but he says, and there. So he kind of gives them two things. It seems like two things, right? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. And so it appears that Peter is saying, you need to repent and get baptized in water so that your sins are forgiven, right? So that's what he's saying. It's important for you to understand this. You will not go to heaven unless you are baptized in water. I'm just kidding when I say that, because <laughs> I tricked some of you. I tricked some of you guys there, okay? okay. <laughs> I'm making some of you nervous, okay? Because when you read this, you're like, uh, it kind of seems that way. And there are some people that actually believe in that, but when you look at the whole of Scripture, that's not really the whole of Scripture. And when you dive into the deep meaning of this, what really Peter is saying is this is how it really could be, should be translated. He's saying, be baptized because your sins are forgiven. That's really what it is, Okay. So I say that just to make sure you're awake. Okay? Well, make sure you're awake, okay? Just don't let your pastor preach any heresy, okay? I just did for a moment there. Okay? We are saved by grace alone, okay? Grace alone. Amen. By faith in Jesus, okay? So water baptism, though, is a step. And so Peter is saying, hey, this is a part of, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you want to commit your life to Jesus, okay, repent, turn your life around, dedicate your life to him, and and also, you should get water baptized. 
we're going to do water baptisms in four weeks. If you want to go public with your faith in Jesus four weeks from now, it's the Sunday after Easter, April 8th, we'd love to have you do that. It would be a great Sunday for you to go public. That's what we like to, to call it. You're going public with your faith. You can invite your friends, invite your family to come and watch you and, and witness. It's a great way just to share about your faith because people will respect a religious ceremony like a water baptism. Come, I'll come and watch you do that. This is a great way for them to hear more about Jesus. And so if you want to do that, invite your friends and let us know too. Sign up at connect at bellroadchurch.com. But we're going to have a fun day celebrating baptisms on that Sunday. If you've never been water baptized, then take that step. It's just going public, saying, I'm, I'm, I'm following Jesus, so I'm going to go public with, with this thing. All right, so let's go ahead and, and bring this to a close here. This is the last few words of this section here. We're gonna, we'll finish chapter 2 next week. One of my friends, Pastor Jeff Peterson, he's one of our network guys, one of the network officials. He's going to be here next week. Great guy, great pastor, great leader. You're, we're going to finish up chapter 2, so make sure you don't, fin- don't miss next week. But let's just look at these next two verses here. It says this, with many other words, he warned them, speaking of Peter, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. We could probably say the same thing today, okay? And those who accepted his message were baptized, so they did get water baptized that day, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000, that's a lot of water baptisms, wouldn't you say? Probably took a little while. If we have 3,000 people decide to get baptized on April 8th, we might be here a little while. But we'll do it. As many want to get baptized, okay? I feel like it might be a little less than 3,000. But what's interesting is that that is probably only counting the guys because that's what they did back in those days, right? They just counted the men. They didn't count the women and the children because it was very sexist, so sexist, weren't they? How dare they? Like, we had National Women's Day this week. They would have never celebrated that, right? (laughs) <laughs> all the women, all the women are super excited. Yeah, Woman's Day. <laughs> Amber, what does your hat say? Doesn't your hat say something about it, girl? Girl power, girl power right there. That's what I thought it was. Yeah, girl power. <laughs> uh, that was like a worldwide phenomenon. I had never seen it so widespread last week. That would not have, that would not have been okay in this culture. <laughs> it would not have celebrated National Women. They probably had National Men Day, like every day but not Women Day. So there's probably way more than 3,000. A lot of people uh, are part of this first church, okay? So it starts with 120. They're having this prayer meeting. Holy Spirit falls on them. They're empowered to be a witness. Peter stands up, delivers the first Christian sermon, and the number balloons from 120 to 3,000 plus is now a part of the first church. This is how Jesus starts the church. I love it. So... Prayer is obviously very important. It's what birthed the church. Prayer is going to be continually uh, be an important part of our lives and our church. Also, we see from this group of people that Jesus used, diversity is also very important. The church starts in and with diversity. But uh, above all of that, here's what the church is all about. The church is all about Jesus. We all uh, worship him, look to him. We all are uh, under the banner of that name. We all unify under Jesus. He is the message. He is who the church is about. And I pray that he is who your life is all about. I pray that people would hear and see and know and experience the power and the message of Jesus through you. And so I pray that God would empower you to be a witness for him, to take that message. Because guys, it's all about Jesus. It's not about you. It's not about me. As cool as you are, as nice as you are, as important as your life is, it is not near as important as Jesus. You and I live for him. And I read this really cool story this week. It was a story about this Vietnam veterans parade that took place in Chicago years ago. And uh, this pastor was actually describing this as he's watching it on television. And they had this big, huge banner that the veterans were carrying in this parade and it had the name of every Vietnam soldier who lost their life in Vietnam, just like that, the memorial in the nation's capital in DC. So they had this big banner and they're carrying this banner. And so these news reporters are covering this and one interviews this, this one veteran and come to find out this guy traveled a long ways away to be there. 
It's like, why are you here? Why did you travel all this way to be in this parade in Chicago of all places? And that man went straight to that banner, which was right there, and he circled the name. He says, I'm here because of this man right here. I'm here to honor this man. You see this man right here? And tears began to just flood his face. And he says, this man gave his life for me. I'm alive because this man gave his life for me. I'm here. I'm alive because of this man. And he said it over and over again with tears streaming down his face. The camera zooms in on the banner to the name, zooms out. Tears just streaming down this guy's face. He continued. I guess it just kind of, he just kept going. I'm here because of this man. I'm alive because of this man. This man saved my life. And he kept repeating that and circling it. And, and I thought to myself, what an amazing imagery for you and I on being people who just point to Jesus and say, no, no, here's, you understand, I'm alive. I'm here because of this man, Jesus. This man, Jesus, he changed my life. You see, I was going in this direction and, and I surrendered my life to him and he changed me. And he's real and he's powerful and, 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 and I live for him. My life is all about this man right here. It's all about Jesus and we just point to Jesus. Just like that man did for his friend, but we're pointing to a man greater, and that's Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And I pray that we would live with passion like that. And we would continually point people, not to ourselves, but to Jesus. Why don't you stand to your feet, guys? We're just going to pray that God would give us boldness. God would empower us to be that type of people. Why don't you go ahead and close your eyes and uh, let's, let's just start looking to him. Oh God, we're thankful for your Holy Spirit that you poured out on that day in Acts chapter 2 that is still moving across the earth. Holy Spirit, you're still moving. You're moving and working and acting even right now in this room, in our lives. What an amazing thing. Holy Spirit, right now, I pray that you would touch our hearts soften our hearts. Lord, some of us in this room, we've, we've got hard hearts. We put up walls. Lord, soften those, break those walls right now. Holy Spirit, I pray. Draw us to you. Draw us to you right now. God, many of us in here, Lord, we, we believe in you, but maybe we're not as bold as we could be in our faith. And so, God, I just ask that your Holy Spirit right now would empower us. Empower us. If you have... If some people haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray that today you would do that. Jesus, baptize people today. Fill them with, with Holy Spirit empowerment as they receive this baptism, this immersion in your spirit. Lord, let that happen today, I pray. And I pray that the result of that would be greater boldness, a greater desire to, to stand up for you, Jesus, and to proclaim how good and real and amazing you are. Holy Spirit, I pray that you do that in the name that is above all names, and that's Jesus. In the name of Jesus, do that right now for all of us. Stir up greater faith, greater boldness for all of us, I pray, right now. In Jesus' name. In fact, if that's, if that's you, you just want to be a, a, a bolder witness for Jesus, come on, just lift your hands up to him. Just begin to ask. Hey, God, use me. God, help me. Holy Spirit, empower me. If you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, come on, just begin to ask right now. Say, God, fill me with that gift, that baptism that took place in Acts chapter 2. It still happens today, so begin to ask him right now. Holy Spirit, fill me, baptize me right now. And I just, I'm just going to pray the Holy Spirit is going to fall on you. He's going to touch you even right now. Even right now in the name of Jesus, I pray. In Jesus' name. Hmm. Come on, just begin to cry out to him. Just begin to ask him. Lord, fill me with greater boldness. I don't want to be ashamed of you and your gospel because your gospel has power. I don't want to be ashamed. I want to stand up for you. Come on, just begin to ask him. Holy Spirit, help me to be a light, to shine as a bright light for you. Use me. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. If you could keep your eyes closed, just ask one question here. Maybe you're here this morning and just say, man, I, Tyrone, I need to surrender my life to Jesus. I need to begin a relationship with him. I need to do what we talked about here today, and that's repent, confess of my sin, and really turn towards God and live for him. I'm just going to count to three in a moment. When I get to three, I'd love for you just to slip your hand up, and I want to pray for you and pray with you. And so we'll just pray a prayer together from just from right where you're at, but you would just slip up your hand saying, yeah, that's me, Tyrone. Today is my day to live for Jesus, give my life to him. Maybe it's a day to rededicate your life to him too. Maybe that, this would be a great day for that. But I'll count to three. Just slip up your hand. Then we're going to pray. One, two, and say, man, I, I need to live for Jesus. Three.
Anybody here? Say, that's me. I need that. Thanks. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Anybody else? That's me, Tyrone. Maybe for the first time, or maybe this is, I just, I got to rededicate. I, I got to repent. I've been wandering away and walking away from God. Anybody else? So we're all going to pray this prayer. Just keep your eyes closed. And I'd love for all of you to repeat this prayer with me, especially those of you that just slipped your hand up. This is you and I just with our own mouth, just asking for forgiveness and declaring Jesus as our Lord. And so you, as you speak this, you just, I'll just give you some words. You repeat that, but speak them from your heart. This has got to come from you, not just reciting some words. So would you say this? Say, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your love and for your grace right now I realize I'm a sinner and I need to repent and ask for forgiveness forgive me of all my sins help me to live for you I declare right now today that Jesus you are my Lord and Savior and I want to live for you for the rest of my life in Jesus name Amen Amen. Come on, go give a hand to those that just prayed that prayer right now. Come on.